Thank you so much for joining us at the Catholic Information Center for our discussion today on the Equality Act and gender ideology, how to respond with courage, truth, and love. I'm here today with National Review columnist and fellow John McCormick and Mary Rice Hassan, who is the Kate O'Byrne Fellow in Catholic Studies at the Ethics and Public Policy Center here in DC. And you can learn more about our speakers by reading the video description below. And I'd also like to encourage you to sign up for our email listserv and social media. It's the best way to stay up to date on all the intellectual and sacramental programming that the CIC has to offer you. And uh, with that housekeeping taken care of, without further ado, um, John, why don't you take the screen and take us through the Equality Act? Sure thing. Uh, well, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you so much, everyone who's uh, tuning in today. It's great to talk to you, and it's an honor to uh, talk alongside the great Mary Hassan. Uh, so today I'm just going to give a short overview of what exactly the Equality Act would do and how it goes beyond existing Supreme Court precedent in several ways. I think this is one useful way to think of uh, the Equality Act because the existing Supreme Court precedent uh, established in 2020 in the Bostock decision, it's not going to go anywhere anytime soon, even with the addition of Amy Coney Barrett on Supreme Court. Uh, that decision was a 6-3 decision uh, that Justice Gorsuch wrote. So even with the addition of Amy Coney Barrett, uh, it's still got a, it's going to have at least a solid 5-4 five, five majority. Um, you know, what Justice Gorsuch wrote in that majority decision, uh, he said that, um, you know, he, he thought that as an, an originalist and textualist reading of the 1964 Civil Rights Act led him to conclude that the statute's, pro, the, the, the statute's prohibition on sex discrimination in employment also prohibited such discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and transgender status. Now, uh, many conservatives blasted Gorsuch's reasoning as faux originalism. Uh, Justice Alito and Justice Kavanaugh made the case in separate dissents uh, that no one believed that the original public meaning of the word sex in 1964 thought that that also meant sexual orientation and transgender status. Alito also warned uh, that the Bostock decision could have all sorts of troubling implications on a number of issues, uh, from religious liberty to women's sports and more. And Gorsuch countered Alito by saying, hey, those questions are not before the court today. Uh, they'll be answered another day. Uh, well, what the Equality Act seeks to do, it, it wants to answer all those questions today in the favor of one side. So the first way that the Equality Act goes far beyond the Bostock decision is its implication for religious liberty. Uh, Gorsuch wrote in that majority opinion in Bostock that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is one important protection for religious liberty. Uh, known as RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is a federal statute passed almost unanimously by Congress in the early 1990s that instructs federal courts to employ a balancing test in religious liberty cases. So it doesn't say one side's gonna win everything, one side's not going to win. Uh, it says, uh, the, uh, as Gorsuch wrote in the Bostock decision, he said, RIFRA, quote, prohibits the federal government from substantially burdening a person's exercise of religion unless it demonstrates that doing so both furthers a compelling government interest and represents the least restrictive means of furthering that interest. Because RIFRA operates as a kind of super statute displacing the normal operation of other federal laws, it might supersede Title VII's commands in appropriate cases. Uh, but as the University of Virginia law professor Douglas Laycock has said, the Equality Act, quote, goes very far to stamp out religious exemptions. Uh, Laycock is both one of the country's leading experts on religious liberty, as well as a longtime supporter of same-sex marriage and a proponent of enacting a federal uh, LGBT rights law, uh, so long as it, in his view, protected religious liberty. Uh, but in, in an interview with National Review, Laycock explained that the Equality Act, quote, regulates religious nonprofits, and then it says that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act does not apply to any claim under the Equality Act. This would be the first time Congress has limited the reach of RIFRA. This is not a good faith attempt to reconcile competing interests. It is an attempt by one side to grab all the disputed territory and to crush the other side. So uh, the second way the Equality Act goes far beyond the Bostock decision is that it adds sexual orientation and gender identity to a separate section of the Civil Rights Act, uh, to Title II 
which prohibits discrimination at public accommodations. Now, the Bostock decision, that didn't touch federal public accommodation law because the, sec the section of the Civil Rights Act, Section 2, that's public accommodation law, it doesn't ban discrimination on the basis uh, of uh, sex. Only Title VII, which governs employment, bans discrimination on, on the basis of sex, which Justice Gors Gorsuch and five other justices said also means sexual orientation and transgender status. Uh, the Equality Act also greatly expands the number of businesses that count as public accommodations under the Civil Rights Act. Uh, for example, it gives a long list. It explicitly covers uh, shelters, uh, which creates the problem that some women fleeing violent men could be required to live in quarters with biological men who identify with women. Uh, in fact, the Equality Act defines a public accommodation very broadly. It's it, as, quote, any establishment that provides a good service or program. Uh, as I'm sure everyone knows, uh, the 1964 Civil Rights Act was passed to smash Jim Crow in the South, uh, this huge regime of impression, uh, but it had a much more narrow list of public accommodations, such as a hotel, a restaurant, a movie theater, or concert venues and the like. And so uh, when, you, when you think about this, the biggest source of conflict that this section of the Equality Act is going to create is how it would affect schools. Um, now, the Equality Act can't supersede the First Amendment, um, but that, of course, depends on how the Supreme Court interprets the First Amendment. It used to interpret uh, RIFRA. That used to be their interpretation of the First Amendment. Then they got rid of that in, in a case in 1990. Congress said, hey, we want you to use this standard to the federal courts and the Supreme Court when judging cases. This is an extra protection of religious liberty. Um, and, and the courts have also established, you know, there's just been expanding precedence on the ministerial exception. Uh, the ministerial exception is uh, the doctrine that holds that the uh, free exercise clause of the First Amendment protects religious bodies from hiring and firing ministers as they see fit. So there was another case in 2020 called the Our Lady of Guadalupe decision, which held that two Catholic elementary school teachers that do teach religion as part of their job, they qualify as ministers. Therefore, the government has no business saying who, who should be fired or employed. There's no federal employment protections there. Um, but you know, it's not yet clear whether the court would extend the ministerial exception uh, to say high school teachers who teach a particular subject that does not include uh, an explicit teaching of religion, but you know, they're nevertheless supposed to publicly affirm uh, the, the faith and morals of uh, their, whatever their religion may be. Um, you know, but there are many areas in which both religious and public schools would likely be subject to the Equality Act's mandates. Uh, for example, the Equality Act explicitly states that, quote, with respect to gender identity, an individual shall not be denied access to a shared facility, including a restroom, a locker room, a dressing room that is in accordance with the individual's gender identity. So again, that's a big problem there where you've had many people, uh, even, even on the, the left, people like Andrew Sullivan, who is a leading advocate uh, for, for same-sex marriage in this country, he says the Equality Act goes way too far. It's too extreme. Uh, obviously, there are issues there where, you know, teenage girls should not be subjected to being in a locker room with someone of the opposite sex. Um, another area of conflict is going to be uh, the area of women's and girls' sports. Uh, even the editors of The Economist, which is not exactly a bastion of social conservatism, uh, warned congressional Democrats that the Equality Act risks discriminating against female Americans by requiring women and girls to compete against athletes who are biologically male and therefore have, uh, you know, much more physical capacity uh, to compete in sports, but they identify as female. Now, some federal courts are already taking the logic of Bostock and they're applying it to Title IX into women's sports and public schools. And President Biden's sweeping LGBT executive order will create many of the same problems as the Equality Act for things like shelters and schools and women's sports. Uh, but you know, it's easier to rescind an executive order whenever there's a new president than it is to repeal a statute once that's firmly embedded in law. Uh, so a third way that the Equality Act goes uh, beyond the Bostock decision is that it could create a mandate for taxpayer funding of elective abortion and uh, violate the conscience rights of medical providers who oppose abortion. Uh, both my National Review colleague Alexander DeSanctis and Richard Dorflinger, a veteran pro-life advocate, have separately explained that the Equality Act bans discrimination on the basis of pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical condition. And courts and the federal government have interpreted related medical condition to mean abortion. So it's therefore quite conceivable that the courts, if, if the Equality Act were passed, would soon interpret it to require private insurance and government health care programs to fund abortion. Um, so, you know, the Bostock decision is certainly going to create some of its own controversies. Um, as mentioned above, the, the logic of Bostock is easily applied uh, by federal courts to women's and girls' sports. Uh, it just hasn't been imposed nationwide yet. 
And uh, the, the core holding on employment discrimination will create certain conflicts as well. There, there are already some real world examples you can point to before Bostock passed. Um, for example, there was a, a fifth grade teacher in Florida who began identifying as transgender. Uh, this created a conflict where many parents didn't want their children uh, subjected to discussions of transgenderism and gender ideology. Uh, the teacher was transferred to work in, among high school students, uh, but it now seems a Bostock decision would settle such disputes in favor of the teacher who identifies as transgender. Uh, but, you know, Bostock has largely accomplished what advocates of an LGBT federal anti-discrimination law wanted uh, in terms of employment non-discrimination. Uh, and there, there's really no chance of being overturned with uh, Justice Barrett on the court in the foreseeable future. Uh, so that's why I think it's, again, useful to examine the ways in which the Equality Act goes uh, beyond Bostock. As for the state of play in Congress, uh, the, the Equality Act will almost is almost certainly dead as it is, uh, so long as the filibuster, that is the 60 vote threshold for most legislation, remains intact over the next year and a half under the current makeup of the Senate. Um, you know, even if the filibuster were abolished in the next year, if Joe Manchin broke his word, Kirsten Sinema broke her word, um, it's still, I would say, unlikely that the Equality Act simply passed as it is written today, as it passed the House. Uh, Joe Manchin, senator from West Virginia, uh, the most moderate, if you will, uh, uh, Democrat in the Senate who is still uh, fairly liberal, uh, he was the only Democrat in Congress who opposed the Equality Act in 2019. And to my knowledge, he has not yet changed the position. Uh, Maine Senator Susan Collins, she was the only Republican senator who co-sponsored the Equality Act in 2019. Uh, but she told a newspaper recently that she is not co-sponsoring the bill in 2021 because uh, there were certain provisions uh, that needed revision. She didn't explain what exactly, and she didn't explain whether she'd ultimately vote for the bill, even though she doesn't co-sponsor it. But it still seems that even if she did, it's just impossible to think that there would be 60 votes for the bill in the Senate as it is. Um, you know, what about a scenario in which the filibuster is gone and you just need a simple majority uh, with Kamala Harris as a tiebreaker to pass it? Um, I, I think there would probably be some revisions. Um, in particular, uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act language might be struck uh, stricken uh, so that uh, you know RIFRA would be a defense. Um, that's still not not a lot of uh, relief for uh, religious liberty advocates, but it would be something. Um, uh, as it stands, I, I do think it's hard to see Democrats offering any such compromise because they simply think. Uh, that would get 10 Republicans because, you know, they've come to believe it's simply a, it's a fundamental matter of rights, human rights, civil rights, uh, that any of these areas of conflict where, you know, conservatives, uh, social conservatives, and I think almost every Republican in, in Congress would say that, you know, women's sports, you know, should be reserved for women. Um, but, you know, this is a very sweeping policy change. It has a lot of implications, um, and it's worth paying very close attention to the debate, even though it seems unlikely that it will pass as is in the next year, uh, you know, there are elections every two years. It's entirely possible that, uh, you know, Democrats could make gains uh, in the Senate next year. They could pick up a couple seats and who knows what happens to the filibuster then. And uh, they'd have a real shot at passing something along these lines. And although uh, it typically happens that the party in power with unified control loses one house in the first two years, uh, that's, you know, that's only happened the last couple of times. It doesn't have to happen that way. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, and with that, I will turn things over to the great Mary Hassan. Thank you very much, John. That was wonderful. Um, let me uh, pick up on a couple of things just for the sake of, of completeness here. Um, Rosemary, I hope the sound is on. I'm not hearing. Uh, but I, I want to just start with just a, um, a summary of some of the points that you made. Um, the most egregious one, you spent some time on the idea that the Equality Act changes how the applicability of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and how significant that is. I want to touch a little bit more on the public accommodations aspect and then spend most of my time on the very idea of gender identity and where we're going with that. So first, a couple of thoughts on the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, kind of working backwards. Uh, one of the things that came up in the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing was the assertion from those who were backing the Equality Act that the law really doesn't do anything to repeal the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It doesn't take away the First Amendment. And that's a disingenuous position or even a, a misleading position that I think it's very important to push back on because the law is specific in what it states. And it states clearly that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is not going to be available. So when you what's what's happening here in the Equality Act is that it is greatly expanding 
the liability of the average person and particularly religious believers to be facing a claim of sex discrimination or, or some other kind of discrimination under the Civil Rights Act because of that expansion, including virtual spaces. So the kinds of places and activities that could expose you to liability is expanded. You have these new categories of sexual orientation and gender identity, which again, I'll talk about that in a minute. But so you've expanded the liability, but then at the very same time, you've said to religious believers, we are going to limit, in fact, we're going to take away your ability to repeal to this balancing test, which is what the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is. It does not give religious believers an automatic win in a claim of discrimination. It simply says that you come to the court and you say, look, this, this law or this, this uh, claim being made on me is burdening my faith. And the, we, the court then needs to look and assess whether the government has a compelling interest to put that kind of burden on the, the believer's faith and whether they have narrowly tailored the, the specific uh, law that's in question. So in order to burden it, the burden religious faith, uh, the least amount possible. So it's a balancing test. So really this goes to the point that John was making here, that this, uh, that uh, Professor Laycock made, that this is really just a one-sided bill that aims to crush people who are not on board with the ideas, the ideologies that are behind it. So it, it completely eliminates the recourse to the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And then also by inserting the language re that um, is related to First Amendment claims, it, it's like putting your thumb on the scale by inserting into this bill language that specifically says that any claim under the Equality Act is being brought because the government has a compelling interest. So it, it's trying to sort of prejudge those claims by inserting into the, the very law language that can be used to say the government has a compelling state interest. This is the most narrowly tailored um, approach to, to getting rid of or eradicating discrimination. But here's the point for all of us who are out here, you know, we're not legislators. What does this mean? It's a clear message to believers that unless you get on board unless you're willing to change your beliefs, unless you accept these categories, then you take your religion and you go behind your closed doors, you go in your church, but you cannot live your faith out in the public square to the extent that it contradicts uh, the assertions and claims that can be made under the Equality Act. And so that's, that's a message that is um, should strike at the heart of every person who values the foundations, the freedoms that our country is built on, because religious freedom precedes the state. It's an acknowledgement that people have an obligation to God, that, that that religious impulse is deeper and precedes the state, and that the state must tread very carefully when that is called into question or, or is burdened. And so this, this law takes the opposite position, and it basically says, to those of us who are believers and believers in, in uh, the sanctity of marriage as being between a man and a woman or the reality of biological sex, it says to us, you're not welcome in the public square, even doing charitable and service oriented activities. So that's a, um, a huge message that we as a country ought to be thinking twice about. Second, um, just a note on the, the public accommodations. As John mentioned, there is specific language in the bill that says that access to a shared facility, such as a locker room or a bathroom, is on the basis of gender identity. And we've seen that states have similar, some states have similar language in their own uh, codes, but we're seeing problems because of that. And that was another um, false idea that was put out during the hearings, that states and municipalities that have put similar uh, language into their own anti-discrimination provisions have had no problems. And that's just not true. And perhaps perhaps they're not listening to women and girls because it's women and girls who are suffering at that invasion of their private spaces, their safe spaces. There have been numerous lawsuits brought. There have been complaints made. There are problems developing in some of the prisons where you have males 
particularly those who've been convicted of sexual assault crimes, uh, once they're incarcerated, going through a quote, gender transition and requesting to be put with the females. You know, all of these things are happening. It's just they don't get the play, the media play, um, because it contradicts the narrative. So, so just realize that's, that's a real thing. It's not just about sports. It's about women's spaces and our, our privacy and our safety. And then finally, I want to focus a little bit more on the idea of sex, that redefinition of sex, which is one of the major things that the Equality Act does, because it redefines sex, which we have historically understood as the, the biological significance, the difference between males and females. And it redefines it to, to include sex stereotype. In other words, all those things that really for the past 40 and 50 years we've tried to get rid of are now being sort of brought back in that that counts as somehow sex, uh, pregnancy, childbirth. John explained the, the difficulty in terms of how that might be treating um, abortion or being a, a backdoor in to provide funding and, and um, requiring people to provide abortions sex characteristics, which reduces the person to body parts. That if you have certain parts, whether they're, they're surgically attached or whether they're natural to your, your body, that somehow that's going to count as, as uh, you being one sex or the other. And then finally, the most problematic aspect of this is really that phrase of gender identity. And there wasn't much discussion about that phrase in itself, partly because we're becoming used to it. But I, I want to highlight something because I think this is tremendously significant for where we go in the future as a country. And that's this, that gender identity is defined as in, in for the purposes of the Equality Act as an identity, appearance, mannerisms, or other gender related characteristics, regardless of the person's sex. Gender is the, the typically is understood as the social role or social expectations that we might attach to being male or female. It's not something that's fixed, that varies over time, it varies from culture to culture. So here we have a, a definition, gender identity, that is really nothing more than a person's self-perception, how they see themselves, what they call themselves, apart from sex. So you're, the law specifically detaches it from any objective, verifiable, um, measurable characteristic. It is all self-defined. And if you read the academic literature promoting gender identity and uh, the rights of, of people who identify as transgender, it all comes back to the right of the individual to self-define, to say, this is who I am. Nobody else can say who you are and everyone else has to go along with it. And it's one of the things that uh, you may remember when same-sex marriage was being proposed, a lot of the discussions were, how is this going to affect your marriage? If you're not, if you're not uh, gay or lesbian, what difference does it make to you if people who identify as gay and lesbian are allowed to uh, have a, a civil marriage? Well, we've seen it affects everything because about one, Gallup came out with a poll just a couple of weeks ago showing that about 1% of adults in the US are in same-sex marriages. But when we look at how the law has changed, we look at what has changed in terms of education, we look at how the perception of what marriage is and the esteem with, with which marriage is held in or not, the declines in marriage, all of that has been affected by this, this confusion surrounding the very idea of what marriage is. So. If we look at gender identity and we say, what difference does it make if someone wants to identify as, as, as someone apart from their biological sex? Well, it matters because reality matters. And it matters because we all have to inhabit that reality. And one of the problems with the Equality Act is that it forces everyone else to be part of the narrative of the person who's asserting this gender identity. In other words, you have to affirm it, you have to validate it, you have to make treat it as if it is uh, a fact, a scientific fact, even though your very eyes will say, I know this person to be a male, not, it doesn't matter whether they identify as female or non-binary, I know this person to be a male. We're supposed to put that aside. And so 
these these categories and these claims affect every one of us because they undercut as as a law it undercuts the relationship between the law and the truth between the law and nature between the law and reality and again that's something that all of us need to be concerned about and it bleeds over into free speech and concerns about compelled speech there was an important decision that came down uh, just a couple of days ago in the Sixth Circuit, which upheld or, or allowed a professor who was told by his public university that he needed to use the the uh, chosen pronouns of a person who identified as transgender and that he was not allowed to express disagreement with that in the classroom. And he won the right to bring suit for that as a violation of the First Amendment. But here's what I would suggest to you, that if gender identity is included in, and the Equality Act is passed or Fairness for All, if gender identity becomes a category in federal anti-discrimination law, what that means is that you can be accused of harming someone else simply for what you say, or even for what you won't say, if you don't validate that identity or if you use the wrong pronouns. And so this is gonna have an effect on our speech and on our public discourse, even in our, on our ability to work together and, and to solve some of the inevitable conflicts that come up. So I wanna just wrap this up here by um, quoting something from a, a wonderful column that was in the Wall Street Journal today uh, by Margaret McCarthy, a professor at the John Paul II Institute. And she said, the Equality Act concerns everything, or concerns things that everyone can see and understand. Infants don't need instruction to know that their mothers are the ones who are nursing them and their fathers are the ones who are not. Sexual difference is obvious to anyone with eyes to see. But what this act does by, by trying to put into the law and what gender ideology does more broadly is to validate this, this different conception of the, of the person, this idea that who we are is self-defined and to force those who, who reject that idea to go along, that in order to participate in society, you have to, in one sense, undergo a forced conversion. You have to buy into it, you have to speak it, you have to, you have to comply, or you're not welcome to be a participant in the public square. And again, this is uh, something that ought to concern all of us because America is uh, just a, a wonderful country that accords respect to all. We respect the dignity of all, but we also must understand that in a pluralistic society, we must make room for each other without trying to compel others to, um, uh, to, to force us to say things we don't believe or to prevent us from living out our faith in the public square. So I think that's, uh, that's enough for beginning comments here on the Equality Act, and perhaps we can go to questions, Rosemary. Thank you, John and Mary. Um, very insightful um, beginning remarks. So we uh, took questions in advance through email, and I saw a lot of common themes, so I did my best to try to condense these all together. Um, Mary, I want to direct the first question to you. Um, during your remarks, you were talking about how women and girls are the ones who are suffering when it comes to these policies. Um, in your interview last month um, in the American Conservative, um, you lightly touched on the sudden and large jump in the amount of early teen girls transitioning, especially um, those identifying as non-binary type. Um, to me, this feels like a dramatic response to starting to experience a super over-sexualized society that at every corner is objectifying them. Um, and in this current political climate, um, you know, shut it down um, seems like a real option now. So why are we shutting down questions about what's behind this? And are you aware of any research going on in this area? Sure. Um, there is a lot of, well, not a lot. There is some research going on to explore that phenomenon that we're seeing. It used to be that people who identified as transgender, for example, tended to be middle-aged men or very young children. And what we've seen in the past five to 10 years is an explosion of adolescents who are identifying, <clears throat> excuse me, as transgender. And while the ratios used to be either predominantly male or parity between male and female, among adolescents, the ratio is two to one female to male. In other words, for every um, 
two females who are identifying as transgender, you will have one male adolescent. So the questions you raise are, are good ones. And I, I think, unfortunately, those questions are being shut down. So when a young adolescent girl, let's say a 13-year-old, is experiencing dislike of her body, is not sure where she fits in socially, she doesn't feel comfortable and doesn't want to be sexualized, she, she's looking for an explanation. She's looking for a way forward. And what the public narrative is, and increasingly the narrative in our schools, is that that discomfort she feels with her body, that sense of not fitting in with that, that um, hypersexualized stereotype, is a sign that she's really transgender, that her authentic self needs to be expressed in a different way. And instead, we ought to be asking the question of a young woman like that, you know, why? What is it that you're feeling? What is it that looks so scary? What is it that is, is so difficult to accept about your body? And to get at the root of, of some of these issues and to make, uh, make the culture respond in a way that truly respects women's dignity instead of, of creating this, this oppressive feel for young girls where they cannot fathom, or at least for a certain number of them, it seems unfathomable to imagine themselves growing into womanhood. And, and as a result, they're willing to take um, testosterone that is going to make them go bald and, and grow facial hair and, and their voice will drop and undergo mastectomies and, and lose their fertility, all within this, this um, intensely compressed time frame of early adolescence to middle adolescence, when, which are times of upheaval. But, but again, that public narrative is pay no attention to those underlying difficult feelings and discomforts, we've got an answer for you. And the answer is embrace this transgender identity uh, and we'll facilitate your transition and you'll live happily ever after. And unfortunately, it just does not work that way. Uh, during your remarks, Mary, you talked about how this all matters because reality matters. And I just want to take that a step further and say, you know, these policies matter because policies affect people and people and people matter. Um, John, I want to direct this next uh, question to you. So the media coverage around this issue has been concerning, to say the least, um, and oftentimes outright deceitful. Uh, I think a clear example of this is yesterday's coverage of Arkansas Safe Act. Um, so how do you as a journalist combat this and what can our audience do to ensure that they read balanced news sources on this issue? Oh, well, you know, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a Washington correspondent at National Review. I, I write out mostly on you know, stuff going on in Washington, not in the States. It just depends. But, you know, I think National Review does a pretty good job of covering issues like this. We have a good news team uh, that fought that, you know, I think we had a write up of the uh, Arkansas law prohibiting, uh, you know, uh, uh, sex change surgeries and uh, puberty blockers for, for minors, uh, while other press outlets were describing it as banning health care for transgender kids, I think was what, what some of the headlines said. Um, so I, I would say, you know, it, if you're looking to get the truth in this, I think you need to go to particular writers, particular outlets. Um, obviously, uh, Mary Hassett and Ryan Anderson of the Ethics and Public Policy Center are both uh, great uh, people you should read. And I think they both do a really good job of uh, you know, speaking, speaking the truth with courage and love, the topic of um, uh, th this, this little talk today. Um, you know, there are some people who are a little bit more... Um, they when you when you when you speak on an issue this controversial they begin to embrace the fact that they're contrarians and sometimes people on twitter just turn into you know they they, they become a little what is known as being trollish they just try and be provocateurs and bomb throwers for the sake of that and you know you never get that with ryan you never get that with mary um you know mary did such a good job during her testimony of you know just laying out the facts and saying that you know, we, we oppose all unjust discrimination. Indeed, the catechism of the Catholic Church uh, condemns all unjust discrimination against uh, you know, persons uh, who, who are same-sex attracted. Uh, you know, the question is, what, what should the law be? Uh, is there a need for a federal law at this point? Should it be narrowly tailored? Uh, would Democrats ever agree to any compromise that was actually reasonable? I think the answer to that last question is obviously no. Um, but, you know, it's uh, in terms of getting back to the main question about media bias, um, yeah, you know, read read individuals. I would say, and even people who don't agree with you on everything. Um, you know, again, someone like Andrew Sullivan, who was the maybe the one of the most 
important people in America in terms of uh, making same-sex marriage uh, become a reality in, in civil law in our culture. Um, but he thinks, again, the Equality Act goes way too far. He's happy to, he's, you know, he's interviewed people, I believe, who, who transition to one gender and then regret it and want to transition back to their biological sex. Um, so I think it's important to, to read individually. Oh, my colleague, Madeline Kearns uh, at National Review, she is, uh, she's made this basically her beat, uh, uh, transgender issues. Um, she, you know, she'll focus on a wide variety. So, you know, look at her byline, look her up. Um, I think she did a great job. She went on the BBC last year and, and was seated right next to um, a, a, a person who identified as transgender. And she very respectfully, you know, engaged with, uh, with, her, with, her, with, her, with her debate partner. And um, I think it was a great job of, I got so Madeline Kearns, you know, Ryan Anderson, his book, even though you can't get it on uh, on Amazon anymore, you can still get it on Barnes and Noble. So I think you need to you need, you need to pay attention to the conservative outlets that, uh, you know, or any outlets really that will tell you the truth on this issue. And I don't know if Mary wants to add anything on this point. Yeah, I, I think um, I totally agree with with what you were saying. And it was interesting that you pointed out um, Andrew Sullivan on this. And, and there are some others who um, I would say I disagree with on most issues, but we agree on the need to just call things as they are. In other words, to state the facts about uh, the human person, the biological reality, differences between males and females, and to state accurately what the laws are about, even if we're on opposite sides. So this issue has really um, shaken up some of those coalitions. And I've found myself working alongside um, radical feminists, again, with whom I would disagree on, on most other things. But where we connect is that willingness to state what reality is and to begin the discussion there and, and to talk then about what's needed and what's required. And so my one additional suggestion for people who are struggling to sort through the media fog is whenever there's something like a bill, read the bill. So if you read Arkansas's bill, it's very specific about the kinds of procedures which are prohibited and why, and the lack of research supporting them, the lack of evidence supporting them, the fact that they're experimental. And so when you actually read the language of that, then the headlines that um, the bill somehow is outlawing, quote, trans health, make no sense. You can see them for what they are. So that's one suggestion I'd make is that most of these things, whether it's a bill or a um, someone's statement or a, a proposed law, court ruling, most of them are, are pretty accessible and and understandable. So read them and and look at the facts and decide for yourself. I love that. You know, going past the rhetoric, going right to the source. Mary, I was wondering if you could um, expand a little bit. You were just touching on it um, just, just lightly. Um, so you wouldn't know based on the media, uh, the media coverage on this issue, but there does seem to be a lot of common ground um, on this issue between progressives and conservatives, um, especially regarding um, access to sports and these cosmetic surgeries um, and uh, puberty, puberty blocking um, drugs for minors. So how can our audience or policymakers build on this common ground? You know, I think it, um, what we're seeing on the national scale is kind of a good model for how we should conduct our, um, just our personal relationships. So for example, I'm thinking of some neighbors that I have who, again, we disagree with on most things, but I can, I can raise an observation about the reality of the difference between males and females in athletics, and you can talk about the science, and you can talk about the numbers, and you can you can um, share facts and have a, a common starting point. And so, with some of these coalitions that we've been able to uh, to work with against these laws, there's a common concern for children for the fact that children cannot and should not be making. Uh, decisions that are going to have lifelong ramifications, not just for how they feel about themselves, but for their body's function, for their ability to um, to be healthy and to make other decisions as an adult. And so uh, some of the, um, I'm thinking of a person who identifies as a trans man, who Scott Nugent, who has been 
absolutely vocal out there on on Twitter, giving talks, speaking to legislatures. Uh, just and this is someone who has transitioned, and yet Scott is out there saying this is not a decision for children to make. And when you look at what these uh, medical interventions entail, any person who who just sort of respects the the beauty of the body and the um, the inability of children to really make long-term decisions at the age of 12, 13, 14, ought to tread very lightly. You know, the first rule of medicine is do no harm. And yet we have rushed in. Uh, and unfortunately, our medical history has some egregious examples of things like this, where uh, especially as a solution to psychological problems, some new... Um, New therapy has been proposed that turns out to have disastrous consequences. And so those who do bioethics will, will look at this and, and will say, well, first of all, what's entailed? What are the risks? What are the benefits? And what's the evidence? How strong is the evidence? And the reality is that the evidence is very weak, low quality. Um, there's no long-term data on doing these things for children. And yet we know the harm is lifelong. When it, you're talking about a child who goes on puberty blockers and then takes cross-sex hormones and becomes sterile at the age of 15, or who has a double mastectomy at the age of 13, 14, 15, and these things are really happening, uh, we all ought to pause and say, whoa, just wait, <laughs> you know, wait, if you want to do that as an adult, I, you know, if, if some people want to support that, that's a different conversation, but we all ought to be able to look at the special vulnerability of children and realize that this is not good medicine and it, it's not just and it's not fair to them. Um, and just one other thought on that. People sometimes say, well, why would, the medicine, why would the medical community be all in on this? Why would they support something that is, has such a poor research base and causes such lifelong long harm? And the answer, unfortunately, is that we have a profit-driven model of medicine, and a lot of people are making big bucks off of the misery of children. So that's uh, that's a, a different problem, but it's it's true. That's that's what's a lot of what's driving this ideology and and the profit motive. Well, that was a, a really insightful point. Um, you know, follow the money, right? Um, John, uh, you know, how do you see this debate playing out in the states over the next few years? Ooh, well, that's a difficult question. Um, let me think. Well, I'm going to follow up once on what Mary said. You know, uh, just not getting back to the issue of media bias and that issue of, uh, of children um, getting uh, surgeries, puberty blockers. You know, I think the first article I ever read on this uh, was that most of the children who identify as something as opposite their biological sex. Uh, by the time they're 18, they end up, the vast majority end up, uh, you know, then identifying again as their actual sex, as they're thinking that their gender is the same as their sex. So it really is, um, you know, that, that kind of information, you know, it used to be publicized in even mainstream sources like the Washington Post 10 years ago, but now uh, you don't really hear much about that. Um, as for your question on what, what what's going to happen in the States, you know, I don't, I don't know what's exactly going to happen. I think that the debates playing out right now are very important uh, for how things are going to shake out. Um, you know, that you've seen in South Dakota, uh, Governor Kristi Noem, who has, uh, you know, been happy to uh, go in com completely opposite direction of, uh, you know, experts uh, on many issues or the conventional wisdom or the preferred ideology on abortion, um, even in ways that I disagree with. I'm not necessarily sure she I uh, got the response to COVID exactly right, and um, but uh, she, you know, decided to veto this bill uh, that would have reserved women's and girls' sports for women and girls uh, who are biologically women and girls. Um, and uh, her her explanations for it, she wrote a piece in National Review trying to defend it. We had editorial cr criticizing her. We had several pieces criticizing her response. Um, they don't really seem to hold up. You know, she basically is kind of saying she's worried that the way it's drafted is going to get struck down in court and it needs to be drafted in a particular way. She hasn't really spelled out what that actual change is, uh, to, my, to my knowledge. But she also seems to be acknowledging that really what is at stake here is the fact that the NCAA has threatened her, that they've threatened, I, I don't know exactly, the exact details of what they would do and not allowing people to compete or host um, 
host tournaments in South Dakota, but she definitely tips her hand and indicates that that is a major consideration in deciding to veto. And she says she's going to now create a coalition with other states. And once we all stand up, once we all have enough states who agree to do this, then we can stand together and the NCAA can't punish us. So, well, which is it? You're going to be able to do it eventually and the NCAA can't punish you or uh, you can't do it at all because the courts will just knock you down. So um, that was a, a discouraging sign for people who think that uh, women's sports should be reserved for a biological woman. Um, and then again, uh, in, in Arkansas, with this law saying, uh, proposed law, I believe it has just passed the legislature. I'm not sure if both houses yet even, um, but I don't believe it's been signed by the governor yet. Uh, you see a lot of, like the NCWA, a lot of uh, corporate pressure uh, being brought to bear on states that go anywhere near this issue. Um, you know, I remember back in 2015, uh, Governor Mike Pence, you know, the hero of social conservatives, uh, uh, many today, uh, you know, he ended up bowing a little bit, at least to the pressure and modifying the religious freedom restoration statute that Indiana passed uh, after it was falsely portrayed as a law to discriminate against um, LGBT um, people in that in that state. So, um, I, you know, I don't know exactly where it's going to go, but, um, you know, if 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 red states uh, can't pass laws like these, um, well, that just that's pretty discouraging uh, for where where things are going to head in the future. So yeah, pay close attention to what happens in other states considering legislation like South Dakota and pay attention to what happens in South Dakota, or sorry, in Arkansas. And I think uh, that'll tell you a lot about where the future is heading. And a lot of this has to do with what we as lay Catholics, lay individuals do and the conversations that we have. You know, uh, John, you talked about your, your colleague, Madeline Kearns, and then, you know, Mary's work and Ryan Anderson's work and looking at Andrew Sullivan and, you know, you know, following what people say rather than what, you know, publications say on this issue. But we have to have courage to talk to not just our family, but our friends and our colleagues about this topic. Um, and, you know, Mary, this, this, I want to direct another question to you because I know you've done a lot on this that's very resource driven. Um, so what are some of the most important things that parents can do on a local level? What kinds of things should people be asking about, look for in their schools? And can you talk a little bit about um, the person and identity project that you've been working on? Sure. Um, several colleagues and I have um, put to have a project called the Person Identity Project. We have a, a website, personandidentity.com. And the purpose of that is to offer resources uh, promoting the vision of the human person that has sustained the world for uh, centuries, and which is really Christian anthropology, the understanding of the human person, male, female, uh, unity of body and soul, but also then um, exposing what gender ideology is all about and talking about the facts, the medical facts, the scientific facts, the cultural and legal concerns, and, and really trying to equip um, people of, of goodwill to understand the issue and then to know, one, how to explain it to their children, how to share the facts with other people, and then how to um, understand what's going on out there in the culture and assess what um, conflicts with our, our deepest beliefs and, and what is just sort of muddying the waters. Because one of the things I've found is, is this, that you know, I, I presume the best of, of people that I'm speaking with on this issue, because I've found many good people just lead with the heart and they say, I wanna be compassionate, non-discriminatory and fair. We're, we're all in favor of that, but we have to think a little bit harder, gather some more facts and understand if that's really what's going on here. So it's a false compassion that encourages a 13-year-old girl, for example, to believe that she can somehow transform her body to really, quote, be a boy. She never can. You know, sex is real. Sex is in every cell of our body. And you look at the um, informed consent documents from the gender clinics. They don't talk about changing someone's sex. They talk about masculinizing and feminizing the body, binary because there are two kinds of, of hormones. There's the female hormones and the male hormones. And so all this talk that we hear out there kind of in the culture that it muddies the water that says sex isn't binary and that um, you really can become who you want to be is contradicted by science. So, so I, I think we need to one, educate ourselves 
help others become educated, just offer facts, offer information, asking questions is a good way to do that. We don't have to lecture someone, but if someone uh, says, for example, as CNN did that um, in an article yesterday that there's no consensus on how you uh, determine whether a child is male or female at birth. Well, yes, there is. Yes, there is. We've, we've not had any doubt about that for, again, for centuries, for millennia. But what's different is now that there's this attempt to portray who we are as gender identity, as, as our feelings, our, our perception. And an infant doesn't really have at least an articulable self-perception. But that doesn't mean the infant isn't male or female. So, so bringing facts in to sort of blow the fog away and, and to really say, what are we talking about here? There's a biological reality between male and female. Then let's talk about how do we help people who are struggling and suffering or don't feel like they fit? Well, let's be more charitable. Let's not have so many stereotypes. Let's, let's open things up. But we have to be able to speak the truth. So educate, um, speak the truth, have courage, speak in kindness and love. Reach out to those who are suffering. I think people need to to know that others care, even when they uh, when we disagree about some very fundamental things. I think that's a great final call to action, Mary. Uh, John, Mary, thank you again so much for taking the time out of your busy day um, to talk to our audience about this important issue. Mary, just like you said, you know this is this matters because reality matters, policies matter uh, because policies affect people, and people matter. So again, research this topic, educate yourself, and look um, to the resources that Mary and John have laid out um, in order to engage on this subject with your family, friends, and colleagues, and to have a compassionate conversation. Um, because, I mean, it's our children. I mean, this it matters. Thank you again so much. Follow us on social media, sign up for our email, and have a wonderful day. And uh, God bless.